Morning and, and welcome um, everyone. I think just first to start off by thanking the NAIC for the fantastic hospitality this week, for hosting us and, and for allowing us to enjoy the wonderful city of Seattle. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the um, IIS for the opportunity to be part of this panel. And as I've been reflecting over yesterday and today, it almost seems inevitable that all roads were leading to this discussion because I think every discussion through these two days at some point has raised the issue of, of protection gaps as an emerging priority across jurisdictions. So very, very happy to be here. I think yesterday we had a couple of questions after one of the panels directly related to, to protection gaps and no pressure, gentlemen, but I think we're going to provide all the answers um, <laughs> um, this morning. But I'm, I'm very fortunate to be here with an incredibly accomplished and experienced um, team of panelists. Um, starting off with um, Shigeru Aruzumi, who you may know is one of the vice chairs of the IIS um, Executive Committee. He's also um, vice commissioner for international affairs at the Japan Financial Services Agency, and very importantly is the chair of our recently established IAIS Protection Gap Task Force. We also have someone who's very well known to the IAIS um, community, uh, Yoshihiro Kawai, who's now um, the chair of the Insurance and Private Pensions Committee of the OECD, also the chair of the recently established uh, Global Asia Insurance Partnership. Very happy to have you here. And last but certainly not least, welcoming you virtually. Good evening. We have Michelle Lies um, on the line. Uh, Chair of the Insurance Development Forum and Zurich Insurance. Um, happy to have you here joining us virtually. Um, as I've Thank mentioned, you, yes, <laughs> good evening. By the way, Kazana, just a, a little comment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear yes, you very well. Very well. Because, uh, I, I could see you before, and then something changed when you started to speak, and I do not see you. But the importance is that you see me. I will try to survive the fact of not seeing you, Yoshi. Yeah, I can, we can see you, Michelle. Okay. Well, so Yoshi said, he, Yoshi said he's going to throw all the difficult questions to you, so just exactly, please, you know. be, please be ready to tackle them. Um, but yeah, so I mean, as I was saying, before we go in, into the discussion, it's, it's very clear that the issue of protection gaps is increasingly of concern. It's increasingly a priority across um, jurisdictions. Um, I mean, I think there was a recently released report by Jafia which highlighted that um, globally on, on average the cost of covering losses from natural catastrophe events that are not covered by insurance have, have increased by about 5% um, over the last half century. And the statistic relates only to natural catastrophe protection gaps. And the reason I'm saying that is I think as much as we're here to talk about NATCAT today, it's also very important to recognize and appreciate that the issue of protection gaps is becoming increasingly prevalent across a number of risk areas and product areas, for example, pension, health, cyber, et cetera. And what I am hopeful is that today's discussion sets the foundation for um, hopefully future broader discussions around NATCAT, uh, about, around protection gaps um, in other areas going forward. And, and I think probably a much larger role for the IIS uh, to play and insurance supervisors to play as well. Uh, I must say I am particularly happy to be part of this panel a fireside chat. I'm still not clear the difference between the panel and the fireside chat because I don't see the fire here. <laughs> so if I keep referencing panel, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, but I'm particularly happy to be here because this topic resonates with me personally from two perspectives. Firstly, coming from South Africa as an emerging market supervisor, and secondly, as a market conduct um, supervisor. I mean, we know that the impact and scale of natural catastrophe protection gaps would differ uh, across jurisdictions depending on complexity, insurance penetration, etc. But I think there is appreciation that the larger gaps are prevalent um, in lower and middle income economies, and this has the potential to impact and hamper economic recovery, which makes um, emerging markets particularly vulnerable to this issue. 
Um, also, as I said, as a market conduct supervisor, where we've got a particular explicit imperative to look after financial inclusion, um, the increasing protection gap raises questions around uh, potential risks to increase financial exclusion for already vulnerable customers. Um, so this is an issue beyond insurance. It's an issue about economic and societal resilience. And we know that insurance can play many roles in assisting with long-term societal resil uh, resilience, not just from the perspective of uh, cushioning the impacts of losses from a natural disaster, but also a preemptive role from a risk mitigation perspective, uh, from, a, uh, prepared, from uh, assisting to be prepared before natural disaster hits. But also beyond that, there's a significant macro role that insurance has to play in terms of assisting with recovery efforts to ensure longer term economic growth, uh, sustainable economic recovery and, and resilience. However, notwithstanding the, the significant role that insurance has to play, the nature, the scale, the societal impact of protection gaps means that we cannot expect this to be just a problem for insurers to solve and the insurance sector to solve. Similarly, we can't expect it just to be the role of government and policymakers. I think something of this nature, of this scale, of this level of societal impact actually means that there needs to be collective and collaborative effort across stakeholders, public and private. And this includes supervisors. Um, and that brings us, I think, to why we're here today. I think this provides an excellent opportunity for insurance supervisors to reimagine their own roles in terms of contributing to longer term societal and economic resilience as it impacts their traditional core functions. And appreciating this, the IIS has now a targeted and intentional focus on natural catastrophe protection gaps, and this is evidenced by the establishment of the Protection Gaps Task Force, which is why we're so lucky to have Shigeru here with us today, because he's the chair um, of the PGTF. And so before we go into the discussion with our panelists, can I invite you, Shigeru, to maybe share with us a little bit about the work of the task force, and also a little bit about the statement that the IIS recently released around natural catastrophe protection gaps. So welcome again, and I'll hand over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farzana. And uh, first of all, I'm very much uh, privileged and honored to have the opportunity to speak uh, in this panel or fireside. <laughs> fireside. <laughs> but I think, Farzana, you have, you have put it uh, all in words, uh, all the important aspects about why we should uh, discuss about protection gaps and how to address it. And I think you, you're, you have put it, uh, you know, I think, totally in context. So, so my role would be probably to provide you with some recap on what we have uh, done so far on the work of protection gap. I remember, uh, I think it was the last June uh, in Croatia when I first uh, discussed or talked about protection gap at EXCO. And um, I think there was a very strong interest among EXCO members that a protection gap is a issue, an issue. Uh, as Fazana mentioned, it's not just about insurance, but, but for insurance regulators to really, regulators and supervisors to really take a close look. And uh, subsequently, we had uh, EXCO retreat in September, as well as uh, the EXCO at uh, Santiago, uh, where we focused about how should we discuss about protection gap? What would be uh, our uh, kind of focus? And uh, we have, uh, in that context, we discussed about what protection gap we should first discuss about. And there was, a, I think, a broad consensus that we should discuss about it in the context of climate change and more specifically on natural uh, disaster. Of course, there are other topics, as Fazana you mentioned, which could be discussed later on. But I think the initial focus for the IAS was clearly uh, to discuss about a NACAT protection gap. And uh, then the IAS agreed to formulate, uh, establish a PGTF uh, which I uh, have the honor to chair right now. And we have very uh, uh, 
very good vice chairs in Pamela Schwermans from the uh, AOPA, as well as Jacqueline uh, Freeland from uh, OSFI of Canada. And there were also very much strong in interest uh, among uh, IS uh, uh, members to participate in the task force. And we have a diverse range of uh, very interested uh, members uh, currently right now. The task force then uh, have discussed, uh, I think, three times after its establishment about how to produce a report, uh, hopefully to be submitted uh, at the next uh, uh, AGM in Tokyo in November. So we are currently working on this uh, drafting report with uh, several drafting groups uh, already uh, in place. And uh, we hope that uh, we can come up with a report, hopefully uh, at, uh, by September or October, for EXCO's uh, approval and to be submitted uh, in November. And let me just uh, add a word about what you mentioned about the public statement. Uh, we, the IAS issued a public statement uh, April 28th, just before the G7 uh, finance ministers and central bank governors uh, meeting. And I, in this uh, statement, it highlighted the importance, as Fazana, you mentioned, about the uh, impact on not only economic but societal impact of our NATCAT uh, protection gap. And it also emphasized the importance of public and private working together. And also, in, the, in that context, uh, not only the IAS, but could also reach out to the private sector, of course, but also with working together with international organizations to receive valuable inputs so, uh, so that we can uh, identify uh, perhaps the way forward uh, in addressing uh, the, the protection gap. So let me stop mm -hmm. there. Thank you. Um, thanks. Yes, I think that gives um, excellent context for, for the work of, of the IIS as we get into t t to today's discussion. So I think there were some key issues that came out um, through your remarks. And so some of the areas we'd like to cover, time permitting today, is obviously to first just start a conversation around how we see the issue of uh, NATCAT protection gaps evolving over the medium term, and then talk very briefly around some of the potential solutions. I mean, Shigeru's mentioned public-private partnerships as an example but also what may be some of the impediments towards achieving that. And finally, bringing him, bring, it, bring it home to the IIS talking um, at the end around what is the role that supervisors have to play. So in keeping with the, the trend of the last two days, we would like to be as interactive as possible. So I think we can bring up the first polling question for you um, to look at on, on your devices. And our first question um, asks you to consider what the likely medium to, term trends would be in terms of coverage for, for NATCAT events. So do you expect this to increase, to decrease, stay the same? Do you see differentiations in different markets, in different geographies? Um, I think while you're pondering on that question, um, we'll turn to, to Michelle, hand over to you. Maybe you can talk to us um, firstly around what you, what you see as the industry expectations of how this is meant to um, evolve in the medium time and medium term, and particularly the role that you see insurance playing. Um, and I think again, it's important to also share with us if you think there's any differentiation in terms of, of different markets. So hand over to you and, and welcome once again, uh, Michelle. Thank you very much, Fazana. Uh, I got a little echo. Okay. Uh, maybe we should decrease that. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this conference. Uh, I think I owe that to uh, Jonathan. I think it's very important that uh, closing the gap is also a subject of this conference. And I'm sorry not to be with you. Uh, let's uh, assume take that as my contribution to the CO2 footprint, uh, on which uh, I think we need to all work together. Let me frame. The, 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 the subject first. I think climate change is definitely increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, such as floods, hurricanes, heat waves, and droughts. Uh, such events accounted for about 91% of more than the 7,000 major disasters between 
1998 and 2017. I do not say that climate change is causing 91% of these large disasters. I just say that 91% of these large disasters are sensitive to very sensitive to climate change. And we should keep probably this proportion in mind. I prefer not to speak too much about what is the amount of these events which are covered by, by insurance. Uh, you have heard several statistics on that, that it has a tendency to depress me a little bit. These disasters pose not only immediate risk to life, but also damage food security, water supply, human security, critical infrastructure, and economic growth over the long term. And given the very, very unfortunate fact that we are likely to exceed the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement, we must assume that net cat protection gaps will grow as vulnerabilities and exposure increase. So we can summarize that probably by saying that humanity's margin of comfort is quickly being eroded. Now to your question, Farzan, about uh, the, the difference between so-called developed and developing economies, I think it's clear that protection gaps exist in every country, emerging, developing, and developed. But they are significantly greater in emerging and developing economies where the consequences of uninsured risks typically are more severe and long lasting because of the lack of personal and state resources to meet these losses. With climate change, we should anticipate and expect an increase in nat cat protection gaps, and the consequence of which will be devastating for all, both developed and developing countries, given the interconnected nature of our world. Now about the role of insurance. We can speak a lot, and I think we can speak a lot about that uh, further in your further question. But the first one is definitely to pledge for a greater risk awareness uh, risk awareness is the first step in terms of enabling communities and businesses to manage risk more effectively and build resilience. Insurers can help bridge that information gap by making use of industry's risk insights and risk management expertise, as well as central role as a guarantor of economic development and financial might as major investors. The insurance industry can provide the insight, protection, and transparency to help address the risk of climate change and should be well positioned to help customers with their transition to a low carbon economy. The more you know about the risk you face, the more you can prepare. And if you allow me just two additional comments. Uh, first, on the changing the risk profile. As I said before, the climate change is anticipated to impact the frequency and severity of natural catastrophe, altering the risk profile for insurers. So a risk-based approach to the climate change impact on protection gaps is indispensable, but it raises the question of affordability or insurability of risk as frequency and severity of extreme weather increases for which risk sharing and funding mechanisms are required. And I would like to finish on a positive note. Uh, we speak a lot about technology currently, and I do believe that technological advancement can be good news for us. Advancements in technology such as improved catastrophe modeling, satellite imagery, and real-time data analytics are expected to enhance the industry's ability to assess and price natural catastrophe risk accurately. This, in turn, may help reduce protection gaps by enabling insurers to provide more targeted coverage and mitigate risk effectively. So I think we should see, and we know that in, in, in the insurance industry, we have a tendency to speak about technology and its risks, especially when you speak about cyber or chat GPT. But there is definitely, from the technological side, something which, in my view, can be very, very positive in trying to close this protection gap, being in the way in which we approach our clients, but also being in the way in which we can better target the risk and define them, and with that, define the covers which are definitely needed in the place where they are needed. That concludes my intervention, Fazana, at this Thank stage. you. Thanks, Michelle. And I think to sum it up, I think you said the more you know about the risk, the more you can prepare. And I think that that's an important role for, for everyone in the room uh, to contribute. Um, Shigeru mentioned earlier, you made reference to uh, the G7. So, Yoshi, just to ask you, 
Um, we know that the, the Japanese G7 presidency has um, undertaken a particular focus around disaster risk financing in, in respect of natural catastrophes. Can you maybe share with us a little around why this level of prominence has been given to this um, issue by the G7 presidency? Yoshi, yeah, Yoshi, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I, okay. anyway, um, first, this G7 uh, statement is the first that the IIS name is in the communique, and uh, how do you say, the person who make it happen is Shigeru, so <laughs> behind the scene or officially. So anyway, I'm just, you know, give all the sort of you know, uh, credit to uh, Shigeru. And just to, uh, answering this question, uh, just a little bit background of uh, this protection gap and also my thought. First, you know, we discussed so much in the morning, what's the key risks that uh, we are talking about, and the key risk is very much related to a climate issue for the next five years. And this next five years climate issue is definitely a big issue, but when we consider carefully this climate issue, what is climate issue that the insurance supervisors or community, community can take care of? This climate have to be tackled all the stakeholders, insurance, including insurance sector. But when we see about our sector, climate is one of the issues for you know, our net zero issues. But when we see what we can contribute to the climate, it's definitely our mandate, our responsibility of our industry is provide protection. And this you know, climate, facing this climate change, we have a huge gap. There's an increasing of the economic loss because of the climate change, but insurance does not pace up with climate you know, uh, this loss incre increase. So our mandate to provide protection is not playing an essential role in this context. So when we talk about climate, we have to see what's our mandate. Our mandate is provide protection, and we have to do more. And as we discussed, challenge and opportunities, and definitely opportunities are huge, but challenges are huge, as Michelle mentioned, affordability, insurability is an issue. And one thing, uh, as we discussed, and we will discuss few, uh, later, is what's the impact of us, particularly policyholders, as Farzana mentioned, its impact is very negative, because uninsured or underinsured is definitely is going to increase. And this most impacted person is vulnerable population, emerging market, develop, developing countries, vulnerable people. So we have to play a much, much more important role. And I, I'm sure that she gave a talk about G7 initiative and so on. But what is positive element here is now people or government understand huge issue of this protection gap. And thanks to Shigeru and not only G7, but also ASEAN Plus 3. Again, this Shigeru plays an extremely important role. As an ASEAN Plus 3 mentioned that you know, providing financial protection or resilience is a key issue for ASEAN Plus 3. Because as Clement mentioned, the biggest protection gap existing in this world is Asia. And the coverage of insurance is only less than 10% uh, in emerging, uh, emerging Asia. So emerging Asia is a key spotlight of this protection gap issue. And the ASEAN Ministry Plus 3 definitely emphasize this protection gap have to be addressed. And uh, Farzana, you mentioned that what do I do now is uh, not only OECD chair, uh, by the way, OECD, thanks to Shigeru, you're not only IAIS, but in collaboration with OECD. So OECD, of course, play an important role in this you know, protection gap issue, but also Asia issue, um, uh, global Asia insurance partnership which is a platform of regulators, sub, regulator, industry, and the academia speak together to address this, uh, this protection gap issue. And uh, ASEAN Plus Three uh, definitely address to this protection gap issue to CDRIF, Southeast Asia uh, Disaster Risk Insurance uh, Facilities, which I chair. And this facility provide insurance. It's a government of, uh, initiative, but the ASEAN government 
support this Asian protection gap to provide insurance and other technical assistance and capacity building issue. So definitely, it is my heart and Asia, particularly, I would like to pay particular attention to address protection gap. So definitely, it's a huge issue, society issue, it's a challenge. And the positive side is because of that, there's a huge political support we obtained. And the question is how we, you know, mo keep momentum and make good things happen. Thanks, Yoshi. So, Shigeru, Yoshi name dropped you quite a few times in his response. So, <laughs> it does seem like you're the man no, with the answers. Not, so, not really, but, uh, um, particularly when it comes to, to the work you've done with the G7, I, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add in terms of the, the agenda of the thank Japanese you, presidency. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> you can thank your chief. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much, Fasana. Yes, uh, on, on the G7 front, uh, I think uh, Yoshi put it well. Uh, I think there's a strong uh, consensus among uh, finance ministers and central bank governors on the importance of the issue. And uh, IAS's uh, public statement in April, I think, very much helped uh, to build a consensus among uh, finance ministers and central bank governors, governors who issued a communique on May 13th in Niigata, Japan. And let me just um, highlight some of the important points is that, as Fazana, you mentioned, this is not just about financial sector or insurance sector, but it's a more or less uh, economic system, or as, uh, as uh, Michel also highlighted, and a societal. Uh, issue and that was, I think, the consensus among the ministers and central bank governors uh, on the importance of uh, protection gap. And they have all specifically mentioned. I'll just just read out what was agreed. Given increased frequency and severity of natural disasters that are exacerbated by climate change, enhanced coordination by the private and public sectors, especially for vulnerable countries, is critical in promoting disaster risk finance, including insurance, in order to narrow protect, protection gaps. So that was what was agreed among um, the ministers and governors. And it also uh, highlights the importance of the IAS work, and let me also read that through. We also look forward to a report by the uh, International Association of Insurance Supervisors in collaboration with the OECD on how to strengthen economic and financial resilience against natural disaster risks by the end of 2023. So that was uh, agreed uh, at, uh, at the G7 uh, level. So let me highlight that. And I also would like to uh, perhaps mention a bit about the public statement. I mentioned about the importance of private-public uh, partnership, but this is not just about uh, the role of finance. Uh, we also think that the role of the supervisors can play uh, is, is extremely important. And that's where we are focusing our attention in the protection gap task force. Of course, uh, as the communique highlighted, we are doing this in collaboration with the OECD, but with other organizations as well. And for, for, from the OECD's perspective, we also look forward to receiving inputs, especially on the public and private uh, partnership, uh, which uh, the supervisors can play uh, perhaps a potential role uh, to, uh, to impact the design or the, or the uh, making of any kind of uh, public and private partnership. So that's how we collaborate with the OECD. We also think that the emerging market aspect, as Yoshi highlighted, uh, is extremely important. Uh, using perhaps valuable input from the World Bank or the A2II, which would enable us to perhaps uh, present a more comprehensive, more global uh, response to address uh, that cat protection gap. Yeah, thanks. So I think you've already segued us into the next uh, part of the discussion where we start talking around some of the solutions. But we've, before we, we head off, there, I think if we could bring up the the results of the poll to just actually see um, the alignment. So that's that's very interesting. Um, almost half the audience thinks that there's significant differences based on geography and exposure. Uh, 
I'm not sure to what extent that aligns with what we've spoken about on, on the panel, but I don't know if there's any, Michelle, is there any reaction perhaps? Are you surprised by that response? I must say, I cannot see ah. the, if, if the, the, the answer is definitely that there is a difference by country. I, uh, I must admit that it's not a total surprise to me. Okay. That probably also to do with the famous knowledge that we have about the risk in some places compared to the knowledge that we have about the risk in some other places. And again, I do believe that uh, knowing the risk and knowing what we want to cover is key to progress. Right. Thanks. Um, I think if we if we move along, um, as I said, Shigeru started talking around some of the potential solutions. So if we can maybe put up the the next question. Obviously, there's a range of available solutions, and we'd like to get your input on where the priority should be. So we've got a few, just a few options up for you, which I think you can rank. Should the priorities in respect of addressing NatCap protection gaps, should it be looking at increased adaptation? Should it be a focus on public-private partnerships? Should we be focusing on private-only solutions or, or public-only solutions? Um, again, as you're reflecting on that, I'll turn back to the panel. Um, I mean, so, so my next question, it's actually the same question for, for all of you. What are those steps that the various stakeholders, whether it's public, private, supervisors, um, what is the role that they should be playing to, to contribute? So, Shigeru, I think you've already started us off. Maybe I'll hand over to, to Yoshi if, if you can share with us some of your insights. Um, and, and also, I think, just in your response, recognizing that you've got a wide range of experience across the public and private sector, you may be able to share some challenges that you foresee across the options as well. Just to put um, what we have discussed this morning in the previous panel, I remember Tom uh, mentioned that insurance is fascinating, and Laura mentioned a lack of trust on insurance is critical, sort of, you know, a handicap for insurance. It's very much fundamental, basic issue, but the protection gap, when we discuss, and Susan mentioned this you know, issue that the uh, policy makers' attention is, or awareness of insurance is extremely important. Those are extremely fundamental about insurance, but it's still a huge way to go, and to address protection gap, in, uh, is, this foundation have to be established first. So first of all, Every people understand the value of insurance and human touch. Michelle, I remember you mentioned humanity is insurance. And this humanity or heart of insurance should be delivered to policyholders, existing and future policyholders, policy makers, everybody, society understand the value of insurance. And therefore, you know, this issue, of course, supervisors play the role, but to policy makers, and everybody stakeholders should play a role. Value of insurance should be delivered to consumers, corporation, and society. And that's a foundation. We call it literacy issue, talent development, capacity building, whatever we call it. This is a foundation, and we have to make this foundation built uh, at first. That's a very important message that we have to, and I would like to discuss more on the supervisor's issue, but just this foundation have to be developed together. Yeah, of course, I think we, we'll probably end off the discussion interrogating a little more around the role of um, the supervisors, but Michelle, maybe if I can hand back to you in terms of, of what are some of the immediate and medium steps that you think the various stakeholders should be taking to address this. <clears throat> Thank you, Rosan. I, I, by the way, I, uh, I agree with uh, Yoshi that uh, the position of insurance uh, among the population, uh, some of them knowing it and some of them not knowing it, uh, but the position is something very important. I think the added value that insurance can bring is not perfectly understood and it's probably uh, also our responsibility to make it sure that it happens. Uh, I think addressing the, the growing insurance network test free protection gap requires definitively a multifaceted approach and requires that we, we work all together. 
I, 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 I insist on one of the contributions that the insurance industry globally can bring, this famous risk assessment and modeling. And I would like to, uh, to share with you two uh, concrete cases uh, in which the IDF did participate. Uh, IDF uh, is leading the development of two pioneering global public goods that leverage both public and private sector capability. The first one is the Global Resilience Index. It was launched at COP27 in Glasgow. It provides reference data on climate, natural hazard risk to inform and protect population and economies, particularly in emerging and developing countries. This essential information is open and accessible to all now. That's the first one. The second one is the Global Risk Modeling Alliance, which is co-developed with the vulnerable country V20 that covers, not unfortunately, not only 20 countries, but 58 vulnerable country, the most vulnerable country in the world. It brings access to climate and disaster risk insight where it is needed the most. Working side by side with official and local experts, it offers open risk management tools, data and access to operational risk finance expertise. It's quite unique in offering private sector risk analytics capability for the benefit of public sector programs for public goods. To support this effort and ultimately the development and effective risk management strategy, there is a need to promote data sharing and collaboration among insurers, researchers, and other stakeholders. If you allow me just one comment, I know we will come back to that later on, but on, on, on regulation, I, I believe that regulation can evolve to allow for product innovation uh, without negatively impacting insurance capital or having long process to allow new approaches, for example, encourage greater insurance coverage for natural catastrophe. Government must probably be more critical in exploring opportunities to introduce incentives, subsidies, or mandatory insurance requirement to increase resilience and reduce the reliance on post-disaster government aid. All these measures require a significant degree of knowledge and sophistication of policymakers and supervisors, and I know they have that, but not just of the industry and markets. The IIIS and access to insurance initiative, A2II, have a crucial role in continuing to upskill the supervisory community on risk modeling, parametric insurance, etc. I, I believe that the, the issue is the same for us all. Do we concentrate on the people who enjoy insurance today in order to improve their experience, or do we make sure that we reduce the number, which was 4 billion the last time I analyzed it, of people who do not have any access to insurance? And I think, to be honest, it's a challenge to everybody. It's a challenge to our industry, it's a challenge to the government, it's a challenge to the regulator. Do we make the market that exists safer, or do we make the market that exists safe also, but also bigger? And I think that's, that's quite important. And uh, collaboration and, and partnership is key in that aspect. Uh, we, on our side, need definitively to continue working on product innovation. That includes parametric covers, you know, these one triggering payment uh, very, very quickly, and also micro, micro insurance. We need to work further on risk mitigation and resilience. We need to encourage investment in infrastructure because I think that's the way in which you can protect. And uh, I do believe that one of the key elements is also the international cooperation. We, need, we don't need to reinvent the wheel 10 times. Let's invent it once, which, by the way, is not always invented uh, at the level at which it should be. But let's make sure that we share positive experience and, uh, worldwide. Because there are a lot of very nice initiatives which are taken in some countries and uh, which probably are not shared enough. And let me finish by the need of political support. Uh, if we speak about PPP, we need to definitely avoid this tendency that we have private sector and public sector to be afraid of each other. We need to work together. We are, we are there to solve the problem together. And we need also the societal support. And that brings me back to the comment of Yoshi. We need probably to uh, us, but private sector, but you public sector, to insist each time more on the added value that the insurance can bring to this planet. I think this planet is lacking a little bit of risk management capabilities. And if there, if there is an industry which can bring that, and our partners, the regulators, who can bring that to the front, 
it's definitely the insurance industry. So let's probably be a little bit more outspoken about the added value that we can bring. So I think it's about bringing the added value together. So just picking up from what Michelle has said, as he said, the, the trick or the challenge is making the market safer and bigger, and I would add better. Um, Shigeru, I think what's come through, through Yoshi and Michelle is in order to get there, it involves collaboration, collective effort. I think the intellectual capital that Michelle was talking about exists not just in the sector, but with the policymakers, with the, the regulators. So collaboration is great, but collaboration is not always easy. <laughs> So what do you foresee, your reactions in terms of potential challenges um, in this regard? Sure, I think I, I, I fully agree with what uh, Michelle and Yoshi has shared with us uh, right now. Um, I'm, the Japan FSA uh, looks across the board from banking to securities to insurance, and I'm always uh, very much impressed with the way the insurance supervisors, regulators, or the industry looks at the importance of protection gap. For example, I, I, I don't want to speak too bad about banks, but if you look at <laughs> in terms of the banking sector, do they discuss about, you know, if, uh, they, they discuss about financial stability risks, of course, but do they really discuss about how do we finance the gap that is there, for example, in terms of climate? Of course, the discussion will always begin with how do you address the risks, the risks of climate change. But in the insurance sector, I think what Michelle and Yoshi has presented is that, well, there's a gap, and how do we fill it? And that's very important, not only for supervisors and regulators, but also for the industry as well. And here I think there's a strong sort of uh, push uh, in the uh, insurance sector uh, about how, how can we address this, this issue, uh, particularly, first of all, on natural disaster. So I think that's the most important point. The collaboration or the conversation among the regulators, supervisors, uh, the industry, and also more or less uh, those who are involved in public finance perspective could be quite challenging. For example, uh, there's a gap, so how do we fill it? F from an industry perspective, well, we would very much like the private public sector to come in to take you know, s certain risks, which would enable the private sector to take on more risks. But this is obviously something that, from a public sector point of view, uh, could involve the issue of moral hazard. Of course, it, it, it could also involve issues about providing more public finance, which is taxpayers' money in the end. So there are sort of a challenge there on how they can actually collaborate. If you look, another example for me, and I don't know if the audience agrees, is about, uh, if you look about risk uh, analytics, risk management, differentiated pr premiums, and that, of course, can uh, encourage policy holders or potential policy holders to build a more resilient uh, infrastructure or to, to have a sort of an ex ante uh, response on risk adaptation and so forth. But if it goes in that direction, if it goes maybe too far, then it could mean about financial exclusion if you really push that forward. So there's always a challenge, or I wouldn't like to call it a trade-off, because it's supposed to be, and we a want balance, it to be. Right? A balance. Uh, yes, a exactly, balance. Uh, or a win-win a situation, mm. uh, or a balance, as you mentioned. Mm. But those are, I think, potential challenges that, could, uh, uh, that, could, uh, that we could face in discussing about uh, public or private partnership, or a conversation, or dialogue between the uh, industry and uh, the supervisors and regulators. But having said that, I think there's a strong, I think if there's a strong will on both ends or, or among uh, the stakeholders that I just mentioned, 
I think uh, we would uh, surely benefit uh, in promoting this issue, uh, although there might be some challenges ahead. So uh, I think that uh, by promoting this issue, uh, it would enable uh, all the stakeholders to get together to discuss about uh, this, uh, this uh, policy object objective to push forward. Of course, and I think this type of platform and this type of engagement is the perfect opportunity to do that. I did want to say as someone who has both the privilege and the challenge of supervising both banks and insurers, I will reserve my comment. <laughs> to the point that you made earlier. Um, with that, if we can uh, maybe bring up the results of the poll to actually see if the audience agrees with the importance to focus on collaboration. Excellent. I think it looks like we're all on, on the same page. I mean, so for me, this issue of collaboration is particularly important because, as we've heard, the, the scale, the impact, the nature of the risks may differ from economy to economy, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but I think irrespective of that, the point is in order to address the solutions wherever they lie, collaboration is, is extremely important, and I think that's a key theme that comes up irrespective of which platform you're discussing this, irrespective of which jurisdiction in, in, in which you're addressing this, that again, and I've, I've emphasized this a few times, that there's shared and collective responsibility, which then brings us home to the IAIS and unpacking, well, then what is the contribution or the role that supervisors have to play? Uh, I've said this before, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll say it again, because for me, with all of the emerging issues, accelerating issues that we're facing, it really is an opportunity for supervisors to relook really the role that they play, the contribution that they play. Um, and before we, talk in, before we talk around what the, the panel thinks some of the, the focus areas and priorities should be for, for supervisors, for the IIS, and to help inform the work that Shigeru and the task force is doing, it would be interesting um, to hear also from you where you think supervisors should be um, focusing their, their efforts. So what role should supervisors play in efforts to address NATCAP protection gaps? And I think we've got a range of um, options from, from data analysis to incentivization to regulatory reform to consumer education and, and literacy um, all the way through to, to reduction of regulatory barriers. And I think Michelle also touched on that earlier. So I will then maybe hand back to you, Michelle, uh, to get a sense, what do you see expectations from insurers or from the industry as to the role that supervisors should be playing? And again, to elaborate a little on, on what are some of those barriers that you think su supervisors should help remove in, in addressing this? Thank you, Rosanna. First, I, I think that uh, from what I've seen in the in the in last years, the, the the issue of protection gap is is becoming so intense that definitely I feel much more a spirit of collaboration than a, a spirit of opposition, which which is I think very important. When we address the challenge of this planet, we work together with our regulators, and we do not spend our time just fighting. So it's with a lot of humility that I speak about what I expect from the regulators, and they can also probably say what they expect from the insurance. But I, this sense of togetherness is something which is, in my view, very important. The, 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 the supervisory mandate should probably evolve. That's a little bit what I've said, but to, to include the promotion of insurance markets development with a specific view to address protection gaps and inclusiveness. So let's start. Let's stop concentrating on what exists, and let's start start to expand. But that's something I could say probably also to the insurance industry. Within these various mandates, supervisory can play an essential role in supporting disaster risk assessment, maintain a risk-based approach, and develop risk management practices. Supervisors operate between the industry and policymakers. They are ideally placed to educate and inform policymakers on protection gaps what relevant elements are missing to achieve more resilient economies and address protection gap. They can help establish trust in between key parties of the ecosystem, government, and the industry. Notwithstanding a significant degree of knowledge and sophistication is required 
of policy makers and supervisors to take on those challenges. And the IAIS and A2YI have a crucial role in continuing to upskill the supervisory community on skill, on risk modeling, parametric insurance, and so on. I think it is also critical that supervisors do promote the transition, avoiding overly restrictive approach uh, with capital requirement for physical and transition risk that are best addressed with what-if scenarios to inform dialogues between industry and supervisors. Rather, they should promote market-based, market-based and risk-based approach like carbon pricing and a policy-making mindset that favors ex-ante risk prevention and resilience building over ex post compensation. If, if I may just spend 30 seconds on that one, because that's an obsession. 90% even more of the money is coming normally after the catastrophe and not before. And it is proven that the same money before would be three to five times more efficient. And we are discussing about these 90% for years, and it doesn't change. I do understand the emotion of an event in which you can show the consequences, but let's be smart for once and let's be, if I may say, uh, realizing that uh, let's not expect to see disaster in our TV screen to make uh, investment to avoid that the disaster happen or at least to limit these disasters. It's incredible. I, I must say that that is, uh, normally when I speak about that, I speak from my heart, but there I speak from my brain. 90% after knowing that if this money would come before, it would be three to five times more efficient. It's, it's just impressive, in my view. Uh, so that's what I want to say. I think the IDF welcome also the, the IAS commitment to rise, raise awareness of insurance supervisors and support them in their role to address that cap protection gaps and the recent statement issued in April 2023. Just two minutes on reputation risk. In terms of insurers, there are some reputation risk. You know, the, the most important one being the, the perception of insurance in some sense as good accessible only to the privileged and being less relevant to the broader society. So let's make sure that uh, we work all together to avoid this impression. Uh, there is definitely also some issues of affordability, which brings sometimes You've seen the case in California, you've seen the case in Australia, insurer leaving some places. It's, it's not the good news for the insurance, but there is a moment in which probably the, the unbalance of the risk brings the insurance company to take this decision, which normally accelerates some political uh, changes. But uh, again, it does not probably improve the reputation of the insurance industry. Then, if you allow me to conclude on the, the, the famous challenge of our democratic government, the issue of short-term and long-term action. Resilience cannot be built in months, and often the necessary investment do not align with political cycles. It also presents a reputation risk for government, who ultimately will bear the burden of financing response and recovery in the absence of robust insurance markets. We should not shy away from thinking through possible collaborative and risk-sharing solutions. This is where communication around risk, as well as public-private partnerships, are relevant and the work of the IDF and the IAS, where we focus on emerging and developing markets, are key. Again, being together. We, we, we are not uh, a group of referees and a group of players. Uh, we, we can really improve the impact of the game. And I do believe that this is a fantastic challenge that we can tackle all together. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious that we've got five minutes left, Yoshi, and I know you've got some, some important views on the role of the supervisor. So if we could ask you, in two minutes, <laughs> if you can share with us the role that you think the supervisors should be playing yes. before we conclude. So yes, so very concretely, oh, two, <laughs> two things, you know. One is uh, what makes uh, lacking is leadership uh, mm. in this movement. Uh, and now, as Michelle mentioned, industry like uh, our industry and the collaboration with the, you know, our international organization like IDF takes a lead, but it's quite high level people and the uh, IAS, of course, initiate this discussion, conversation, but it's not all supervisors. And what is missing is conversation, communication, or stakeholders, industry, regulators, 
government like Ministry of Finance should share the view that we have to address protection gap together. And that's initiation or co collaboration of supervisors, like you know, Shigeru does in Japan, other supervisors can do initiate this conversation with stakeholders, industry, and uh, Ministry of Finance or government. Second, as we discussed in the beginning of this session or this conference, our role, supervisor's role, is not only protecting existing policyholders, but un underserved or unserved policyholders have to be protected. We have to have a huge mandate as an insurance supervisor to protection of con consumers, as Vicky said. You know, we have to just to remind what's the mandate or our important mandate of supervisors and just think about, for example, how to react with industry. Now, he, there is a huge gap. It's not supervisor and supervised relationship. Supervisors should collaborate or co collaborate with the industry and stakeholders to develop the market underserved people. That's a very important step forward. International collaboration that we discussed in previous session, supervisors not only sup uh, providing capital or you know, governance sort of you know, uh, support or you know, encouragement, but also how do we serve underserved population in emerging market supervisors. This kind of collaboration is definitely is important. So return to the basic, but also much more fundamental you know, collaboration and also you know, action industry and regulators co cooperation. That's the message, thanks. No, thank you uh, very much. I'm now conscious that we're standing between you and lunch. Um, so maybe before we, we, we close, if we can bring up the, the results of the, the final poll in terms of the role that supervisors have, have to play. I think it's pretty evenly split in terms of the first few, but maybe I'll hand over to you, Shigeru, because I think we've had some fantastic insights today through the panel and, and of course through um, the, the responses on, on the panel, but in order to help support and drive and advance the work that the task force is doing, if we can maybe close with additional input, support, or help that you'd like from stakeholders to actually help progress uh, the work of the IAIS. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Pazana. Yes, I think the polling questions answers were very indicative of uh, how uh, the supervisors and industry looks at this issue. Number one is uh, the challenge we face is the difference of mandate, supervisory mandate, because some supervisors only have a financial stability mandate. Some others have more broad mandates like insurance market development and so forth. So the challenge for us is to ch how to discuss this with different mandate supervisors all in one room. So that's a challenge. But I think what, how we can overcome this is, well, respect, irrespective of your mandate, there's a wide range of mandates. And even though there may be some mandates that you're, you do not have, but others may have. But don't exclude or deny what is being discussed there. And try to you know, be, acknowledge the difference, but to uh, discuss it in a comprehensive manner. That, I think that's uh, very much important. And also, what role that the supervisor can play? Uh, the public statement uh, in April identified such issues like risk analytics, uh, providing incentives or implementing uh, regulation to encourage risk prevention measures and actions to improve financial literacy and risk awareness, that's important, and also to affect the design uh, or the implementation of the PPP, as, as, I, uh, as uh, we have all discussed. So there are roles that the supervisors can play. And this answer, I think, uh, you know, illustrates that there are a wide range of issues that everyone would be interested to be solved. So uh, this kind of uh, shows the expectation uh, from everybody in the room that supervisors should address all these issues in due course. So that, I think, reinforces uh, the fact that, uh, reinforces the argument that we should uh, move, push forward on this uh, going forward. And I think, last but not least, the, polling the answer to polling question one is also a very important one, that there are differences mm -hmm. 
in jurisdictions on how to uh, solve this issue. And we have to be mindful of that. The danger of, of being too responsive to this is you create an encyclopedia of what is being done everywhere and just say, well, this is how it is yeah. uh, across the globe. The important fact is to map out what is being done, but to try to extract a common perspective or lessons that we can learn uh, in, in the context of uh, protection gap. And I think that will be the challenge for the PGTF moving forward as we approach uh, Tokyo in November. Thank you. So, Shigeru, do you think that considering all of this and the amount of work that there is to do, we will have a report by November? <laughs> it seems like the yeah. scope and the role of the PGTF is likely to increase. Well, if we don't, I will be very much responsible for the finance ministers <laughs> and central bank you governors because they first. are looking forward to the report. <laughs> so. so, ladies and gentlemen, speaking of, of balance, so we had to balance whether we should give you an opportunity to ask a question or give an opportunity to most of you to go to lunch. And we've decided to choose lunch. But for those of you who have, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions, our, our panelists um, are available to answer your questions uh, during lunch. Um, there were so many takeaways. I, you know, I was writing as we were talking, but Yoshi brought it home with, with two key points, and, and I'd like to end with that. I think the first, you made the comment about not just serving existing policyholders, but also those that are underserved. And I would add, also not increasing the net of who we regard as being underserved. And lastly, I think to sum up, leadership collaboration and communication, which is a role that we all have to play. And I think the IIS has set itself very well to facilitate that. We look forward to an update on the PGTF work in Tokyo. Um, thank you all for your attention. Apologies for going over time. Um, best of luck for the rest of the seminar and for those of you traveling, blessed and safe travels. Thank you all very much.